Welcome to Live Doff, your online Doff Yomi Shear. Shalom Aleichem and welcome back to today's Daf Hayemi Maseches Baba Kama Daf Nun Hey. We are holding on Nun Dalad Amabez, two lines off the bottom. So in yesterday's Daf, we compared the Psukim by the Aseris Adibrois the first time around and the second Aseris Adibrois in Seif Advarim with respect to the way the Psukim present the Halachos of Shabbos. So on account of that discussion, we're going to continue and make another comparison between the two sets of Aseris Adibrois, the first and the second. Says the Gemara, two lines from the bottom. Shal, Rabbi Hanina ben Ogel, that was his name. He asked, "As Rabbi Chiyabar Ab, have a question. Ma, why is it so that Bedibrois Harishonus? We take a look at the first set of Aseris Adibrois in Parshas Yisroi, when the pasuk presents the mitzvah of Kibud of Avaim." You know, it, it omits the word Laman Yitav Loch. Hashem will endow you with good. The mitzvah will generate toiv, goodness. There's no mention of that. It says you'll have a long life, but doesn't have toiv mentioned. Loi nemar behem toiv. But in the Dibros, Ube Dibros Achroinis, later on in, in Dvarim, Perak He, Pasak Tezain, they are in discussing. It continues and says, It's going to prolong your life. And it adds, It's going to bring you goodness. So, We have the expression of toiv. Why this difference? Amalai responded, A good question, but you know, you're asking the wrong person. You know, before you start asking me why it says toif here, not there, you know, I'm not even sure that it, you know, shaleni. You should really ask me im nemer behem toif if in fact it says toif there or not, im lav or not. Sheni yadei, I'm not even sure in nemar in nemar behem toif im lav. Not really sure whether it it says the word toif. In the first set of Aseris at Dubrois, or, or not. So it's inter- interesting that the Toysis in Baba Basra, that Kufiud Gimel Manal, brings a raya from here that, you know, at times the Amuiroim, as great as they were, but they were more focused on the Halacha, they weren't necessarily so bucky 100% in the, in the Psukim. On the other hand, there's another shot from the Riaf, that's a, a Purush on the Ein Yaakov. He says that what Rabbi really meant to say was, I'm not sure whether you know the words that are mentioned by Dibris Rishonis in Pasha Sistroi it reflects exactly what was said by the Dibris Rishonis and what is found in Pasha Sveshanon is perfectly reflective of the Dibris Achronis. Because you know it could be that the things that are said in Pasha Sveshanon were really said you know, the first time around as well, but, you know, later on it's expounded and explained in more detail. So that's what he meant to say. You know, I'm not even sure if what you're saying is correct. So in any case, that was his sort of initial response. I can't really help you, but I'll give you some advice. Klach, go ahead and travel to Eitzel Rabbi Tan Chumbar Chaniloi. Why? Because he was an expert. So he had Ragil. He was a Talmud. He was a regular, you know, uh, 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 Talmud, a guest, Eitzel Rabbi Shoban Levi. So you would learn by Rabbi Shoban Levi. Show you Baki Bagada, who was a Baki, an expert in Agada, in, in Drashis, and these types of things. So go to him, I bet you he has a, uh, you know, a pshat for you. Ozal Gabe. So he went to Rabbi Tanchum Bar Chaniloi, hoping that he heard something from his Rebbe, Rabbi Shoban Levi. Amar Alei, so he said, look, you know, actually, I never heard a pshat from Rabbi Shoban Levi, but I heard from somebody else. Listen to this. Elokach Amarli Shmuel Bar Nochem. He told me, and he was actually Achi Imoi, the brother of the mother of whom? Of Shel Rabbi Achim Rachanina. And some say, Amarli, some say he was Avi Imoi, the father of the mother, basically the grandfather, Shel Rabbi Achim Yibrab Chanina. And the answer given was like this. You're asking why in the first Aser Sadibrois there's no toiv? Because ultimately, you know, Hashem knew that those Dibroids are not going to last. They're going to be broken. The Luchas are going to break. It's not going to really be something lasting. That's why there's no mention of Toiv. 
Why is that a reason? So who cares? Omar of Ashi, we don't want to get into a situation where that the goodness will sort of cease, will desist, will have, will stop from Kal Yisrael because if it's mentioned and then it's sort of broken and destroyed, that's going to be an end to the Taiva Chas So it wasn't mentioned. It specifically was not mentioned there, only in the Dibur Sachroines, which are, you know, everlasting and without interruption. Amr Abishu, Haroya Tes so on the topic of tes and, and toiv and goodness, if a person sees the letter tes in a dream, simon yafaloi, it's a good sign. My time away. Because tes is, you know, representative of the word toiv. Well, Ema, maybe tes represents something bad. This is the prophecy um, envisioning bubble going through destruction or to be swept away with a sweeper with a broom. So yeah, test can sometimes mean bad stuff. So the more had the test come in and he only saw one test in his dream. So it's not referring to that word tetasia which has many tests. Rather it's the toif. Maybe it's going on to Pasuk and Eicha, describing the tomb of Kal Yisrael. Well, Tess, Beis, Kamrina. We're speaking that he dreams Tess and Beis, which inevitably means Toiv. Maybe Tess, Beis can mean that the, you know, the gateways of Yishalayim sunk into the ground. So again, it's something negative. Ella says, The reason why Tess alludes to something positive is because the first Tess in the Torah is something good. Why? Shemi Bereshus Adivayara Lakim Esar Lakesiv Tes. Because if you look at the Psukim from Bereshus Bar Lakim all the way till Pasuk Dal, there's no mention of the word of the letter Tes until you get to Vayara Lakim Esar Ki Toiv. So the first Tes is Latoiva. So when you dream a Tes, it's a good thing. If a person dreams, the word has paid. He sees that written down. That's a sign that he was destined for something negative, like a, a eulogy of uh, an account of a tragedy. And Hashem sort of redeemed him. They had Rahmanus and they saved him. They redeemed him. In fact, some of Hashem learned that has paid. You know, the hay and the ches are sort of interchangeable. So it was chas, alluding to uh, compassion to Rahmanus that. Um, yeah, it's the Marsha. Uh, sorry, Taras Chaim. So yeah, he says that uh, the uh, the reason why they didn't show him the the actual you know Hespit experience, only the written in its written form, uh, because the hay and the ches are meant to be interchanged, and it was Nisbatel, the Xera because of the chas because of Rachmanes Vani Bilibuksov, and again this is only in writing, as we explained. So Mishnah tells us that you know all these halachas, including halachas of kilayim, apply to chayos, to behemos, to oifos. They all are included in these halachas. Amrish lachas kan shana rebbe. So in this Mishnah, Rebbe Hakadosh Rabbi Danosi compiled the Mishnah is, is teaching us a wonderful halacha that the halacha of kilayim crossbreeding applies even to birds. So you have different types of birds, different types of oifos. You may not. You know, match them up. Tarnagal Tavas Upisyoni. You have three types of birds. Tarnagal, which is, you know, a hen, a chicken. Vitavas is a um, uh, uh, you know, the bird that has those uh, that long tail with all those uh, colors. A peacock, right? Tavas ufisyoni. That's uh, some sort of slav which they had in the midbar, some sort of fatty bird. So these are three different types. Tarnagal and a tavas and pisyoni kilaims over there. You may not crossbreed them because, as we just said, kilaim applies even to birds. Well, pshita, obviously. I mean, they're th- three different types, three different species. Amrav Chaviva, the chiddush is like this. Mishum the rabba badi adadi. Since you find that they, you know, they sort of are raised with each other, they grow up with each other, they're sort of hanging around each other. Maldot him, perhaps I would think, I would say, it's really, you know, three variations of the same species. Kamash one, the point of the halacha in the name of Rishlakish is no. You should know the three distinct types of species 
in which case Kalayim applies. Amar Shmuel, another example is Avaz, your local duck. The Avaz Abar, a wild duck, Kalayim Zabazel, consider Kalayim with each other. Maskalar Abar, no, Hanan, why are you saying that? My time, who says, who determines that there are different types of species? Elay Mishaw is Himshim, the high Orich Kue. Kue is the beak. This one has a long beak. The high Zutor Kue is a short beak. That you know, sort of makes them different species. Elamiat, if that's the case, Gamla Parsa, Gamla Taya, you have a, a Persian camel and a, you know, a camel used by the Arabs. The high Olam Kue, if I cotton Kue, one has a, a thicker um, neck. The high cotton Kue, other one has a thinner, more narrow neck. Okay, now we have a climb, you're going to suggest that they're climbing with each other. Which is unreasonable. They're, you know, they're both camels. Elam Rabai Sabai answers like this: The reason why the regular avas and avas abar are considered two separate species is because their body build are so distinctly different. Ze beits of bechutz. In one of them, the male uh, egg testicles are on the outside of the body. Ze beits of The other one has it inside, so they're totally different, and therefore they're considered separate species. Rapapa Amar different. Another difference we find: Hot uno chada beyaso b'shichla. One of them, the um, Abbas Habar, the wild one, has only one, you know, egg a- at a time. So it only has, you know, one, it can only load one egg inside, you know, inside of itself at a time. Whereas the local, um, regular uh, Avaz, regular uh, duck, uh, loads up many at a time. So it sort of produces many at a time in its shikhla and its production facility and therefore it's totally different species. So basically we determined that these uh, different types of birds are definitely different types of species, whether it's the Tarnagal with the Tavas with the Pisuni, whether it's the Avas and the Avas Abar, we gave two reasons, either because in the uh, contrast to the Avas Habar with the Bayim Masin outside and it only produces one egg at a shot, the Avas Hayish of the local Avas has it the other way around which sets them apart. Listen to this. A person crossbreeds two um, sort of, you know, sea creatures, two fish, like it. It, gener- it generates Malchus because he did the Aver of Kilai, my time of why. Who says that, you know, this halacha applies to birds? Because we have a Xerashava by the sea creatures. The Pasuk Barashas Aleph Chaf Aleph mentions the word Limi Nehem. And we find the same by other types of creatures, birds, it says Limi Nehu. So just like birds cannot be crossbred, likewise fish as well. Boy Rachva. So now he has a Shiloh regarding Kalayim. Just like you can't crossbreed, you're not allowed to work them together. You can't take two species, two types of animals and work with them at once, right? Have them pull a, a plow, etc. What if you combine a land creature with a sea creature. Hamanik bi'iza vishibuta mal. What if a person, you know, pulls a wagon using a, a goat, iza, and a shibuta, some sort of uh, fish, which can do some work. Mal, well, what's the halacha here? Miyamin and shall we say, even the iza lenachas biyam. Shall we say there's no combo? There's no combine. It's not really a pair. They're not really pairing up. Because he's on land, he's on sea, at sea. A goat, a land goat, can't live at sea. And likewise, a fish has no life up on land. So it's not really a combined effort. They don't really sort of connect with each other. Love Klumovitz, so he hasn't done anything wrong. Or Hashtamiyas Kamanik, but ultimately he is leading his, he's pulling his wagon with these two forces working in tandem. So perhaps it's called Kilayim. Mask of the Ravina. Ravina has a kash on this. El if you're going to take it that far, so are you going to suggest that if a person does as follows, he takes Chiber Chitos he combines a kernel of wheat, a kernel of barley, puts it together in his hands, Vizora Chita Baritz, Usara Bukhutzlar. So this is really Kilaim, but the problem is he's standing right on the border, right on the boundary between Eretz Yisrael, where Kilaim is Asr, and Chutzlar, where Kilaim is Mutter. Plants one seed inside Eretz Yisrael, and the other one, the you know, the barley outside. Are you going to suggest that he's chayiv? Since he planted them together, he's chayiv. Of course not, because they're two separate, la- two separate lands. 
There's no combination between the two. So likewise with the goat and the fish. Amri said the response given was as follows. You can't compare the two examples. How do you compare? Hasan. There it's two different lands. Eretz Mokim Chiyuva. Eretz Yisrael is a place where you cannot plant Kilayim and Atayra. Chutz Loretz, Loi Mokim Chiyuva. But Chutz Loretz, there's no Chiyuva, there's no Isra Kilayim. So you haven't done anything wrong, even though they're very close to each other, because we know that Chayvas Karka, all mitzvahs that are land related are specific to Eretz Yisrael. So the one right across the board, boundary right, doesn't relate, doesn't connect. There's no Isra. But, but here, Hacha, when he is uh, pulling his, uh, you know, his ship with, um, you know, two, let's say with two uh, types of fish, right? Right? Either way, he's doing, he's doing an isr. Because two fish, two different types of fish cannot lead your ship. Two types of land, you know, creatures cannot lead your, um, your wagon. So basically, Kalayim in this fashion is Asr on land, and Kalayim in this fashion is Asr at sea. So what difference does it make if you're dealing with two fish and or two different types of goats, or you took a goat and a fish? Either way, you've committed Kalayim. You've combined two different types of creatures who each on its own relates to Kalayim, and therefore combining these two is certainly a violation of Isra Kalayim. Hadron Allah, Shashinog Hasapar. Okay, begin a brand new Perak, Perak Shishi, Perak Hakoines, says the mission. Hakoines Tsoin Ladir. Here we're speaking about sort of lighter animals. Until now we spoke about a shoir or an ox, heavy duty animals. Here we speak about Tsoin, typically used to describe sheep, goats. So instead of speaking about animals that are attacking with their, uh, goring with their, uh, Horns. We're going to speak about these lighter animals, the sheep and the goats, who destroy and damage by way of shane varegel, eating, consuming, or stepping and trampling on things. So this fellow took his tzoyin, his herd of tzoyin, into his deer, into his enclosed, you know, pen, v'na'ab v'fanei koroi, and locked the door properly. The Gemara soon will tell us it's referring to the basic, you know, minimal uh, standard. Um, Shmira, which is called Shmira Pachusa, which is typically adequate uh, to contain the animal. So he locks the door properly. Vanel Fanel Karoi, a door with, which, can, with, which can withstand your, your, your typical gust of wind. Okay, so he's hoping for the best. Vyatsa Vizika turns out that the animal barged out and caused damage. Potter. He's totally Potter because he, he did his part, Rashi says. The Hanatra. He guarded his animal. What do you expect him to do? He's not a miracle man. He locked the door and assumed everything is safe. But suppose he did not close up properly. The animal went out and caused his damage. He's liable for that he has to pay. Let's say he locked up properly and the animal barged down all the night. Right, so again, he's not responsible. Taisa says, even uh, you know, if perhaps he the uh, chiddush is even if he got word, his alarm started ringing. He heard his animal, you know, barged out. We don't obligate him to go run him all the night to go chase find his animal in the darkness. So therefore, if something happens, the animal damages or harms, he doesn't have to pay. Oisha Bertol list him another example is if the list of the robbers came and opened up the pen and out went the animals, so he's potter. The yachts of Ezekiel, the animal went out and caused harm, potter. How it's you a list but let's say the actually picked up the animal and took it out and then it caused damage, they are responsible. List them so the Jewish robbers have to pay. Now let's say, you know, he locked the door, he locked the barn, but it was very sunny, so he left the animal right in the middle of the sun. So he should have expected the animal to, uh, you know, uh, when it gets to a certain point, that his animal is going to 
act out of desperation and somehow get out of that pen. He should have expected that. Or he handed his animal to an irresponsible fellow, a deaf mute, a deranged person, a cotton who's not responsible, but he also went and caused damage. He's responsible. Why'd you give it to this person? But he handed custody of his animal to the Roya, to a responsible shepherd. So the shepherd sort of steps into his shoes. He's now responsible. Now, if a sheep is walking along the road, Nafla Laginan sort of slips and falls into a, a, gina, a garden, a vegetable garden, belonging to somebody else, Venenis, and he ate up some vegetables and he benefited from it. Basically, you saved a meal. Mishalemis Mashanenis, you don't have to pay actual damages, only what, um, what you actually benefited from it because you're not chayv in this case because it was right near, right near the Rishas Rabbim, and we learned this many times. Uh, you're not really chayiv um, for consuming stuff either in the street or right off the street, a place where he slipped off the street. That's considered like pottery shesarab with respect to the salacha. You don't pay actual damage, it's only the hano. But yardo kidarka vizika. Let's say the animal specifically climbed down into your neighbor's vegetable patch and caused damage. That's called shein bechatsra nizak. Consuming inside the victim's territory, you pay actual damages. Now, even when we speak about actual damages, we don't mean literally, you know, banana for banana. How do you do that? How do you evaluate? How do you appraise this type of damage? So as she says, once again, uh, we discussed this many times, if you would have to, you know, sort of evaluate that specific uh, item that he damaged, let's say he ate up a patch of Carrots. One patch of carrots is worth a thousand dollars if it's sold on its own, you know, retail value. But since we're speaking that it was part of a, you know, a big field, ultimately the the value of this field is not really diminished by that much. Not really, you know, the the loss isn't so severe because a person wouldn't necessarily pay a thousand dollars less for the entire field in totality, just because it's missing what one patch. So rather than appraise that specific patch standalone, we sort of take the entire picture. In its totality, and we deduct only in as much as this, uh, um, you know, one less patch deducts from the overall price of that field. Okay, so let's see the Mishnah. Kate said, Mishlam is Mashiach. Zika, how do you do that? Shaman base saw by Sasad. We take a base saw, which is, you know, a big area, and we say like this Kama Hisa Yafa, Vikama Yafa. How much was it worth? How much was it valued before this damage took place, before the, you know, carrot patch was destroyed? The Kama Yaf and how much is it worth now? So that difference, which is you know quite small, relatively small amount, that's how much you pay. Rabbi Shimon Oimer, well that only works if the patch was not filled with you know ready to pick vegetables. So it sort of relates to the field, and you give this sort of comprehensive appraisal. But Achla Peros Gemurim, Mishalemas Peros Gemurim. Let's say these carrots were fully you know ready to be picked, so it no longer relates to the field. You have to look at it as an independent entity. And you pay exactly what you ate. Im sa, if you ate a sa, you pay a sa. Im sa saim, if you ate two sa, sa saim, you pay two. Tana Rabbanu. So Mishnah speaks about guarding your animal karoi properly. What does that mean? Ezo karoi, ve'ezo shaloi karoi. What's called proper, what's called improper? Well, dela she'yichel olamad b'ruch metsuya. If you put a, you know, closed it with a door that can withstand a ordinary standard Typical gust of wind, zeokaroi, that's called adequate security. Sheino yichoy the lamad berach matzuyu, if it cannot withstand your typical wind, zeokaroi, that's called inadequate security. So, bottom line, shmira pechusa, you know, basic shmira is sufficient, but you don't need shmira maula, the higher level of shmira, you know, perfect shmira. Omar, mani bar patish mantana. Mantana Mud the Sagila Bishmira Pachuso. Who's this author? Who's this Shita? Who's the um, Tan of the Mishnah that holds that even a Mud? Why are we calling it a Mud? Because uh, as we explained, we're speaking about damaging through Shane Varegal, which are totally Mud from day one. It's not like, you know, Karen which has to sort of build itself up. It starts at the time as a relatively innocent type of thing, and then it sort of builds up, becomes habitualized and regular. Sign using the shame of regal, that's uh, a mood from day one. He's liable from day one, 100%. So, who says, who tells us that a uh, for a mood, even a shmir pachusa is sufficient? That must be a 
Hashitas of Yudah Disnan, we had this Mishnah way back. Kishorei Bala Vimaisera, let's say the owner of the animal tied it up with its, you know, reins, with its muzzle. Vinol, the fall of Karoi, and locked up properly. Vyotza Vizek went out and caused damage. So that's Shmira Pachusa. Basic Shmira, Echatam, Bechad Mod, Chayev. Divir Meir, Kuntir Meir, Shmira Pachusa is never enough. You need to do a real high level guarding to be absolved from the tam and the mood damaging. So the Mishnah Bayas, which allows Shmira Pachusa, is evidently not Rabir. Rabbi the Oimer, no. Tam Chayev. By a tam, you need a higher level of Shmira, but by a mood, where everybody already knows it's a wild animal, to keep away, putter there, even a Shmira Pachusa is sufficient. By the mood, Right, you have to pay for its damages. Why? Because you neglected to watch at all. You never watched anything. Evidently, if he did apply any sort of shmira, your pata v'shamar huzeh. If he did a shmira pachusa, it's considered shmamar. You're you're good. So, our Mishnah, which tells us that a shmira pachusa suffices for uh, uh, a muad, must be Rabbi Yudah speaking. Rabbi Lezo Eimer ain't lo shmira la sakin. He takes it a step further. The only way to guard a muad is by doing a sakin. You shecht it with a knife. Basically, there's no way to guard it. Okay, so our mission is Rabbi. Well, says the Gemara, no, doesn't have to be. I feel the tamer of Meir. Perhaps our Mishnah can be followed by Meir as well. So why are we letting you get away with the Shmira Pachusa? Well, Shani Shengar Regal, that Torah me ato b'shmirosin. Remember, our Mishnah is speaking about damaging, not by way of goring, by attacking with a horn, something typical to a, a shayr. We're speaking about a tzoyin, doing Shengar Regal. And we find that the Torah minimized lower the standards with respect to your Shmira obligations regarding Shein Varegel. How do we know this? And even Rameir agrees. The Amr Belazer, the Amr Belazer, say, Masnisa Tana, we added in the Brisa, Arbodvar, with respect to the following four damages, HaToyra Me'ata B'Shmiros, and the Torah lowered the standards and required only basic Shmira. What are these four things? Ve'eluhein, Boyer, right? You dig a pit. You don't have to, you know, stuff up the pit. You don't have to refill it. You have to just cover it. That's relatively minor shmira. And once you do that, you're good. Ve'ish. Right? What are your responsibilities regarding your fire? As long as you did some sort of shmira, it's enough. V'shein v'regel. These two as well. How do we know? We have a raya for each one. Bar d'chsev k'if tachish bar. Akiich reish bar v'leichasenu. Person opens or digs a bar, he's chayim because he didn't cover it. Haki so potter. Evidently, if he covered it, it's potter, even though he didn't plug it back up again. So it's relatively, you know, shmira pachusa. So you're potter. Evidently, that's enough. Regarding an age, tchsev shalim yishalim hamaver sabera. You're only chayim if you actually light the fire. You go and you burn. Ad oved kein maver. Only chayim if you actually go and you burn it down. But if you did some sort of guarding and shmirah, you're good. Likewise, when it comes to shame, the chsev ubir b'zdei acher, ad avid keinu beer. The Torah, in describing your animal being mazik through shame, uses the word of beer, indicating that the owner sort of actively did it. He did it, but if he withheld, if he secured it somewhat, you're okay. Same thing with regal, with trampling. The chsev v'shilach, he sent his animal. It was an outright act of damage. David came to Shilach. He actually damaged. But if he did some sort of Shmira, even Shmira Pachusa absolves him. Vitani Vishilach say a regal. Now, how do we know these Pesukim must speak about Shane the regal? It only says Ubir. It doesn't say Shane. It says Vishilach. It doesn't say regal. So we have those other Pesukim, which we had back on the Beis on Beis, if you remember. Ubir Vitani of a Braisa. Vishilach say a regal. Vishilach means regal. Chino Oimer Mishal Chay Regal Shalva Hamar. So we find Shiluach alluding to trampling, to regal. Ubir, that's referring to eating. So gol is the tooth of the animal, which is sometimes open, sometimes closed, sometimes covered, uncovered. So yivar is alluding to consuming by teeth, by, you know, shame. So it's an act of eating. And bottom line, these psukim are referring to shame or regal. And we learn from here that even basic watching basic guarding is enough why time with the Ovid Kain Vishilach Ubir he's only chai he's only liable if he did Vishilach outright Vishilach Ubir outright Ubir meaning he's totally negligent and totally careless but if he did something to you know protect 
something to secure, something to prevent. But otherwise, he didn't do that. He did shmirah pechus alo. He's not chayiv. Amar Rab, Masnis and Namiteka. I could even prove, you know, from the wording in our Mishnah itself, that we're speaking about the hezek of Shein Varegel and not Kera. And that explains why Shmir Pachus is enough, even according to Rabbi Meir. By the way, the Mepharshim explain, you know, why. Rabbi Meir says, when it comes to Kera, you have to do Shmira uh, Mu'ula. You see, because there, the, the animal is going to habitualize itself. It's going to do over, it's going to habit, get more and more dangerous. And certainly if he's already a Mu'ad, he's a dangerous animal, Shmir Mu'ula, but nothing less works. Whereas when it comes to Shane, you know, Shane Varegel, uh, you know, he's a mud from day one. Basically, this is his, part of his nature. He walks around, he eats. So it isn't, you know, such a, 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 a outright expression of, of, of aggression, of hezek. And there, you know, sort of you can contain it, you can try to contain it, even with a basic shmir. So once again, Rabbi will prove this from our Mishnah that we're speaking about Shein Varegel, Masin Namideka, Dektonei Tzoyim. Why does the Mishnah sort of switch to Tzoyim? Mechtev, let's take a close look at these words. Bishar Kaskin and Vasi. Until now, we had five Prakim discussing primarily a shar, an ox, a bull, causing damage. And suddenly we switch to a light animal. Maishna Dektonei Tzoyim, why do we switch to Tzoyim, to sheep and to goats? Lav Mishum Da Torah Miyata Bishmirosin. Right? That's because we're trying to highlight this point that the Torah lowered the standards, required less shmira in this case. Why? Lab Mishum the Kan Karen Luxiva. The reason is because over here by Tsain, there's no mention of Karen in the Torah. They don't that's not their uh, forte. Right? Luxibba, Shame Rebu Luxibba Bay. The Torah relates to the Tsain as one who's gonna damage through Shane the Regal. So apparently that's the switch, that's the reason for the shift. We're switching to a different type, different mode. Of harm, of damage. The Kamash Malon. The point of the mission is the Shane Varegel, the Mu'odan Hu. That we specifically pick Shane Varegel who are Mu'od from day one. So it's a different type of creature, different type of behavior. And Shvamino, the right from here, that in fact that's the difference. That makes the shift. That even according to Rabbi Meir, when it comes to Shane Varegel, a Torah was Memait in the Shmira, and even Shmira Pachus is enough. Okay, let's recap today. Is that? And Amad Alpha spoke about the word Toy mentioned in Dibris Achreinus. Because those are going to be eternal, uninterrupted. We want Teva to be present by Kali Yisrael forever. A person sees a test in a scholem, it's a good sign. Hesped means that they're looking after him and that Rahman is on him. We learned that Kalim applies to all types of creatures, Behemoth, Chayas, Oifais, and even Dagim. We have the Mishnah. Shmira, Pechusa, suffices by the Tsoin, who are going to go out and do Shane Varegel. And we concluded that it worked even according to a mayor. Because when it comes to Shane Varegel, Shmir Pachusa is enough. All the best to you and Atzlacha Rabba.